Number four, Acts chapter number four. Am I on here? I'm not on? Let me try it again. It would help if the mute button was not turned on. Very good. Acts chapter number four. I was thinking as he sung that song, the words of Jesus, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus did that for us. Of course, we're coming into the season in which we will observe and consider and think about the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on our behalf. If you found Acts chapter number four and you're able to stand, would you do so as we consider the reading of the word of God here this morning? Acts chapter number four, we'll begin reading in verse number one. As they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. It came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. When they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power, or by what name, have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucify, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. With God's help this morning, I'd like to preach a message that I've simply entitled, The Power of the Gospel. The Power of the Gospel. Father, we thank you again for this service, and we pray, the Lord, as we now enter into this preaching portion, that you would settle us all. Lord, we pray that the distractions would be minimal. Uh, Lord, it, 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 we pray that there would be no distractions. We pray that the the, the wicked one would be bound and that the Holy Spirit would have an opportunity to move and to work in all of our hearts and our lives. Lord, we, we come to this service with so many different needs, so many different people, and we pray that you would, Lord, help us. Lord, that the Holy Spirit really would take the message that is preached and that he would apply it to each and every individual heart as he sees fit. Lord, would you fill me and would you use me? Uh, Lord, just a, uh, just a broken vessel in many respects, but I pray that you would uh, take what little I have, and, and Lord, may you use it in the hearts and lives of these that are here as we try to preach your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. As we considered last Sunday, the day prior to what we've read of here in Acts chapter number 4, Peter and John were making their way into the temple when they came across a man that had been lame since birth. Instead of giving this man some money, to make it through another day, they proclaimed healing in the name of Jesus Christ, and this man immediately received strength to walk. We learn of that in Acts chapter number 3, verses 6 and 7. And this caused quite a stir on the temple mount, and a great crowd inquired as to how this man they all knew to be lame was now walking. How, how is this possible? We have seen him for years sitting at this temple gate, and we've given him money. We have given him of, uh, uh, these alms that he has requested of us, and how is it that he, that he possibly has strength and healing to be able to walk? Not only is he walking, he's leaping and he's running, the Bible uh, indicates. And, and Peter was given a captive audience and, and he preached the gospel to them. And the Bible tells us in Acts 4, 4, we read it just a moment ago, that 5,000 men placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ on that day. 
The Bible does not give us the count of women that perhaps heard the message as well and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps it was even many more than that. And so in other words, something even a day greater in many respects, the day of Pentecost, when only 3,000 souls were saved and baptized and added unto the church. This day, 5,000 souls came to know Christ. And at the end of the message, as they were drawing it all to a conclusion, they were arrested. And they were placed in jail, the Bible says, until the next day. And the reason they were apprehended is given to us in Acts 4 and verse number 2. The Bible says, because they preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. The following day, we read just a moment ago, they stood before the religious council about this manner. And I think it's sometimes it's hard for us to fathom, it's hard for us to comprehend that men would have to endure a trial because they healed a man and because they preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's exactly what takes place. And as I see this count and as I read it, there's one overriding theme to me that, that appears throughout this whole story, even going back to Acts chapter number three. And that, that is this, that is the power of the gospel. In fact, it's not, even, it's not even just seen in Acts 3 and 4, but it's found throughout the entire book of Acts. And in reality, the entire New Testament has this as its theme. The power of the gospel, the change uh, that people undergo, the, the transformation that happens in a life when someone encounters Jesus Christ, when they meet the Lord Jesus Christ and he becomes their Savior. What is the power of the gospel? might ask that question. What does that mean? How does that uh, apply to me? How do, I, how do I know what it is? How do I know if I've encountered it? Well, let's consider, first of all, the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel simply means good news. It's good news. And the good news that Jesus Christ died for you, that Jesus Christ loved you enough to come and to offer his life, that's good news. Somebody ought to say amen this morning. That's good news. That's the gospel. It's good news. It is the history of the birth, the life, the actions, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Peter was more than just a capable preacher of the gospel because he had lived it. He had watched all of these things. He had a front row seat. He had an eyewitness view of the gospel itself. Three years, more than three years, he spent every day with Jesus, hearing him, watching him, living with him. Uh, he, had had, he had had this unique encounter and this experience. He'd seen it all, including his death and his burial and his resurrection. That is the gospel. It's good news. It's the story of Jesus. Well, what's the power? Where does the power come from? I think it's pretty clear the power of the gospel resides in the person of the Holy Spirit. It comes from the Holy Spirit. I remind you of Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 8. Jesus is getting ready to ascend back to heaven. He's getting ready to take his seat at the right hand of the Father, having completed all that God sent him to do, having been the, the propitiation for our sin, having secured atonement for us. And just before he left, he looked at his disciples, his followers, and he said to them, but ye shall receive power... Notice, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witness unto, unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. And that power came upon them in Acts chapter number 2 on the day of Pentecost as they were assembled there in that upper room and as they were of one accord praying and seeking God's face. And the Holy Spirit descended on them and, and baptized them in the Holy Spirit. And they received this power and they went out and they preached the gospel. And now all of a sudden that gospel has power, great power through the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us 3,000 souls were saved and added to the church that day. The Old Testament prophet Joel prophesied of that day in Joel 2.28 when he said, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And I, and I pray to God that as I stand before you this morning that I stand here with the same Holy Spirit power that Peter stood before his audience on that day of Pentecost and that Peter stood before that council and that the Apostle Paul preached in that same power of the Holy Spirit and the other men and the other people that were uh, affiliated with the gospel and preached the gospel. That same power is available to us today. The Holy Spirit is still working. And we ask ourselves the question, I hope to answer them for those that may be skeptical. The first question I want to answer is this. Is the power of the gospel available to us today? Is it? Let me ask this question. Was Jesus real? Did he come? Did he die? Was he buried? And did he rise from the dead? 
Is it any less true today than it was 2,000 years ago? In other words, the gospel itself, it's the story of the life of Jesus and his death and his burial and his resurrection, his power over death, hell and the grave. Has that changed? It has not changed. That gospel is still good news. It still applies to us today. It still meets us where we are. And if there's someone here this morning that came into this auditorium and you were lost and you're without Christ, then maybe you're a good person and maybe you've done some good things, but you've never been born again. You've never been saved. You've never repented of your sins and placed all of your faith and all of your trust in Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you the greatest news that you'll ever hear in your life. It's not that I can give you some unbelievable amount of money. It's not that I've got a nice car waiting outside for you and I've given you the title deed and you get the keys. It's not that I'm buying you or building you a brand new house. Listen, those things will eventually wear out. Those things will grow old. Those things will spend and be spent. But I want you to know something. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The gospel does not change. It's still available to us today. It's still the good news. And if you're here this morning, then you've never been saved. You've never been born again. In just a moment, we're going to extend an invitation, and we're going to invite you to leave your seat, as many, many hundreds, even thousands have done in this very room over the years, and to walk an aisle, and to allow someone to take this Bible and point you to Jesus Christ, and you can meet the best friend you've ever had, and you can hear this good news for yourself. The gospel has not changed. Is it available to us today? Of course. Let me ask you this question, though. Is the power available to us today? The gospel, we know it's still true. We know it because the Bible tells us, because history tells us, yes, Jesus Christ was a real person. He lived a real life, and our world has been changed as a result of his life. But is that power still available? Let me ask you a question. Has the Holy Spirit left us? The Holy Spirit is God according to Scripture. He was promised to the church by Christ in John 14 and John chapter 16, and specifically, I state to you this promise that Jesus gave his disciples in John 14 and verse number 18. He said, I will not leave you comfortless, speaking of the Holy Spirit. I submit to you that the gospel has not changed and that the power is still available to us today because the Holy Spirit is a person and because he's still alive, you cannot, you cannot put him away, you cannot destroy him. He is God just as Jesus was God, just as the Father is God, the Spirit is God as well. And the power of the gospel is still available to us today, those of us that desire it. So we ask the question, is the power of the gospel available to us today? And the answer is an emphatic yes, without question. We can speak that with assurance, not uh, because of anything other than what the scriptures tell us, what the Bible proves to be true about the power of the gospel. But then we ask the second question, well, how does this impact us? What impact does the power of the gospel make in our world? And I hope with the time that we have left to show you the impact of the power of the gospel to show you the change that is made in a life when they encounter Jesus Christ. Can I say, first of all, number one, it gives boldness to the fearful. The power of the gospel gives boldness to the fearful. Would you notice with me in verse number 13 of Acts chapter number four? Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, would you... Um, would you go with me back approximately two months in time? I'm talking about in time from when Acts 4 is given. And would you take your Bibles and go with me to John chapter 18? It's the middle of the night. Jesus has been arrested. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of angst. Notice, if you would, in verse number 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. That disciple, I believe, was John. So the same two characters found here in John 18 are the same that are being questioned in Acts chapter number 4. The Bible says in 16, but Peter stood in the door without then went out that other disciple which was known unto the high priest and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. And the service, servants and officers stood there 
who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Would you look with me in verse number 25? And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, therefore, unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Would you go with me to Mark chapter 14? Mark chapter 14, and would you look in verse number 71? This is, this is Peter. Mark, Mark gives a little bit more details than John does. And notice verse 71. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. In the wee hours of the morning, Jesus has been arrested and is withstanding false charges in a phony trial. There's a man standing in the background and he's watching all of this very carefully. He's approached by a young woman who asserts that he was one of Jesus' disciples and he adamantly denies this by saying, I am not. The night continues and a short time later, as Peter is warming himself in the cold night, he is approached by another who again identifies him as a disciple and, 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 a, and he says, he denies, he says, I am not a disciple of his. He is approached a third time by a servant of the high priest who claims he saw Peter in the garden that night as a disciple of Christ. And again, Peter denies this truth going so far. The Bible says this to curse and to swear, trying to further distance himself from this, this man by the name of Jesus. His name is Peter. He's a disciple. He is a follower of Christ. But he wants nothing to do with it. He's afraid. He's fearful. What might happen? He's been arrested. If I speak up and if I identify myself with this Jesus, what might happen to me? What might the end result be for me and for my life? I don't know him. I am not one of his. And he curses and he swears to emphatically drive home the point that he is not a disciple of Jesus. And yet, if the Bible didn't clearly tell us, we could never imagine that the man on that night, just two months prior, is the same man found here in Acts chapter number four. What happened? Why this change? Why is he in the darkness of night? He's, he's warming himself by the fire and he's doing everything he can to distance himself from Jesus. And now it's the brightness of day and he's standing in the midst of this council and he's accusing them, you're the ones that put Jesus to death. And yet Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he's alive forevermore and he's the only one that provides salvation. What change has ma made and has happened in this life? The power of the gospel. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Wasn't Jesus alive at that point? Why hadn't he changed him? Because Jesus Christ at that point had not yet died and he had not yet been buried and he had not yet risen. And when Jesus Christ came out of that tomb, I mean, it was game over for those disciples. And they said, we are never turning back. We are going forward because Jesus Christ is power over the grave. And just about every last one of them would give their lives for the cause of Christ. They would die horrible deaths they would die awful deaths and they would be willing to do so because they knew firsthand the power of the gospel. Peter's no longer claiming that he doesn't know him to insignificant bystanders, but rather he's boldly preaching to the leaders of his day the truth of the resurrection. He has the power of the gospel. He has seen Jesus Christ hanging on that cross. He has seen them take the body down and place it in the tomb. And three days and three nights go by. And he has run to the tomb early on that Easter morning. And he stood outside and he's, and, he's, and he's looked at the empty tomb and he's encountered Jesus. And he's seen him as he says, hey, take, take your hands and, and place them in the nail prints in my hands and in my feet. Take your hand and thrust it into my side. It's me. I'm alive. They shared meals together. And not only that, he'd seen the gospel 
Jesus Christ risen again. But listen, he had also been there that night when the Holy Spirit descended on them. Uh, that morning, I should say, on the day of Pentecost. And he is operating not in his own power and his own strength, but he's operating in the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit. And if you and I are going to be effective, if we're going to be what we ought to be, we must know the power of the gospel. If we're going to see God change lives, this is the only way it happens. The power of the gospel gives boldness to the fearful. But can I say number two, it gives wisdom to the unlearned and the ignorant. Would you look in verse 13, going back to Acts chapter number four. The Bible says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, you ever wonder what people think about you? <laughs> you know, the Bible, of course, is the word of God. It's given to us from God, and God knows, listen, God knows what you're thinking. He knows what's going on in your, in your heart and in your life. And I don't think that this council made this statement to these guys. I think they kind of kept that within. But they're looking at these guys, and they're, these, these, guys are, these guys aren't educated. These guys are ignorant. How in the world are these guys standing before us and contending with us? And how are they, in some respects, baffling us? And how have they, how have they captured 8,000 people in a matter of just a couple of days? And they're, and they're now a movement that's going forward. These guys are unlearned and ignorant. These guys aren't very bright at all. These guys are, well, let's just go ahead and say it. These guys are fishermen. Chances are these, these guys had... Hadn't spent a whole lot of time in a, in a classroom anywhere. And these guys probably had a, had a pretty, pretty weak education. The Bible tells us that, that Peter and John, along with most of the disciples, apostles, were fishermen. And Jesus called Peter and his brother Andrew in Matthew chapter number 4, at verses 18 and 19, after a long night of fishing and as they were cleaning their nets, and he said, I want you to leave that all behind and I want you to come follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. And in the next two verses, uh, verses uh, uh, 21 and 22, he does the same thing for James and John. He, he called them from a life of sailing the, uh, the Sea of Galilee at night and letting nets down. And, and, and you know, let's just, be, let's just be real honest. It doesn't really require a whole lot of education to do that. All they had to know was they had to be willing to work hard, yes, but they had to know when was the best time to go and where to go and, and then what to do afterwards and how to clean their nets and then take them and sell them. But, but you didn't, you know, these guys weren't lawyers. These guys weren't teachers. These guys weren't doctors. And the Bible says that this council is looking at them and they're saying, who are these unlearned and ignorant men? But I want you to know something. Listen, when the power of the gospel encounters a life, it doesn't matter your deficiencies. It doesn't matter what the world might think of you. It doesn't matter what the world might say of you. The gospel gives wisdom to the unlearned and the ignorant. Look, I, I don't have a degree from Harvard or Yale or Princeton or any other school. And I'll be the first to tell you, I wouldn't have lasted a day in those places. I'm, I'm willing to admit that. But listen, my name's written down in the book of life. And from God's perspective, that's wisdom there. To repent of my sin and to place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I'll never earn a million dollars in a year. I'll never, I'll never even come close to earning even far, far less than that. I'll never live in the nicest neighborhoods and I'll never drive the nicest cars and I'll never wear the nicest clothes and eat at the finest restaurants. I, I, I'll never have those things. I'll never have the world necessarily coming to me to try to get my input and my perspective. Fox News and CNN, MSNBC, they're not calling me to get my take on what's going on in this world today. I don't have the wisdom that they're looking for, but listen, in the eyes of God, I am wise and you are wise. Whether you're unlearned and ignorant or not, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, if you've repented of your sin and if you're operating in the power of the gospel, God looks down at you and says, that's a wise man right there. That's a wise woman. That's a wise little boy or little girl because they've placed all of their faith and all of their trust in me. And you may not be worldly wise, but you can be heavenly wise, which is far better. I don't have that stuff. I don't have those talents and those abilities. I can't, I can't argue apologetics with the best of them, but I can read the Bible and I can tell people how to be saved and I can point them to Jesus Christ and, and, and I, I, can't be, I can't be everything to everyone, but I know what the Bible says and I believe the Bible and the Bible says that makes a person wise. 
So, why is the power of the gospel important? Because it gives wisdom to the unlearned and the ignorant. It gives boldness to the fearful. Can I say number three? The power of the gospel is powerful because it gives strength to the weak. Verse number 14, notice. The Bible says, And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. As Peter and John were being questioned, there happened to be a specific man who seems to indicate, the Bible seems to indicate that he had refused to leave their side. Well, I don't suppose that would be much of a surprise. If someone did for you what had been done for this man, you probably wouldn't want to leave their side either, would you? I mean, he had been carried everywhere he went for his whole life, 40 years. He had, he had, he had struggled and he had been lame. No one had been able to help him. No doctor, no medicine, no therapy, no treatment whatsoever could give this man strength. And yet one encounter with Peter and John, and all of a sudden he's walking and he's leaping and he's running and he's praising God. And he says, hey, look, I don't know too much about you guys, but everywhere you go, I want to go. He said, you sure about that? We're getting ready to go to jail. I'm with you, man. I'll spend the night with you. I just want to be by your side. You guys have given me new life. And as they stand before this council, pretty intimidating, a pretty fearful place, standing to their side, not being questioned, but just standing there, is this man who had been lame. And everyone knew that he had been lame. And now he's standing. It, it, it's, it, how can this be? I mean, he was a well-known Jerusalem beggar. Why is it significant that he stood with them here? Because 24 hours earlier, he could not walk and had never been able to walk. And yet now, he stands before them with no problem whatsoever. Can I say, when the power of the gospel touches a life, it gives strength to the weak. I'm not talking about physical strength. I'm talking about spiritual strength. I'm talking about a, the aspect that when we were all born, we were born dead. We were separated from God. When you meet Jesus, he, he raises you up. He gives you life. He breathes new life into you spiritually. And you are never the same. Just like this man was forever changed, you and I can be forever changed when we meet Jesus Christ. Listen, God does, doesn't ever guarantee a physical, financial change. But if you encounter him, you will be changed spiritually. In other words, God, God doesn't say, look, if you, if you trust in me, you'll, you'll have all the money you could possibly want. God never guarantees that. God never guarantees that if you'll, if you'll trust me, you'll never have to worry about getting cancer or some other wicked disease or you'll never have to worry about having to have surgery or getting sick. God doesn't say that. Well, listen, God does say this. If you'll drink of the water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. If you eat of the bread of life, you'll never be hungry for anything else again. That, that, that which I give you satisfies for time and for eternity. And you'll never long for anything else. You'll never have a need to long for it. You stay close to me and I'll give you all that you need to grow in this faith and to navigate the difficult life that God sometimes allows us to live. And so why is the gospel powerful? Because it gives strength to the weak. It gives boldness to the fearful. It gives wisdom to the unlearned and to the ignorant. Lastly, number four, it gives evidence to the skeptics. Would you notice, we'll continue reading. The Bible says, but when they had commanded, verse 15, them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them, is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. I'm talking to some people, that when you first got saved, your family and your friends talked behind your back and they said something like this. Well, he's going through a phase. She's going through a phase. They'll, they'll snap out of this eventually. I don't know too many phases that last 25, 30, 35, 40 years. Some of you have been faithfully serving God all of those years. And your family and your friends can no longer look at you and say, it's just a phase. But they have to look at you honestly and they have to say, man, real life change has come to that individual. And as those men stood there and they looked at Peter and John, they thought, you know, I suppose we could do something about them, but 
We can't do anything about this guy. Everyone knew him. Everyone knew where he'd come from and what he'd been through. Many of us had put money in his cup as he begged each and every day. And now he's standing and he's walking and he's running. And this guy wasn't playing games all those years. Nobody would do that. We cannot deny that a notable miracle has taken place in his life. May God help us all to live in such a way that people look at us and say, you know, I thought it was just a phase. I thought it was just something that they'd eventually move beyond. But I can't deny it any longer. It's been years now. And they've gotten rid of some of the things that maybe they used to be involved in. They no longer curse and they no longer swear. They no longer go to some of the places they used to go. They no longer do some of the things that they used to do. Real life change has, has been brought to this man or to this woman. And, and, and what produces that life change? Is it just me turning a new leaf? Is it me making a New Year's resolution? And oh, look, I, I, can't, I can't change myself. I can't, I can't move beyond my own sin because I'm a sinner by nature. Listen, it could only be the power of the gospel. The gospel, the good news. Jesus Christ, he lived. Jesus Christ died. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. The power. Where does the power come from? The power comes from the Holy Spirit. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Have you experienced the power of the gospel? Listen, the power of the gospel gives boldness to the fearful. I mean, it changes you fundamentally. It transforms you just as it did Peter. The power of the gospel gives wisdom to the unlearned and the ignorant. In the world's eyes, you're unlearned, you're ignorant, you're foolish, you don't have a lot of talent, a lot of ability, you'll never make a great mark on this world. But listen, listen, God changed your life and you know it. And everyone who comes in contact with you knows it. And you're using your life to live for him. And God says that is wisdom. It gives strength to the weak. Before you got saved, you were bound and held captive by your sin. But today you are victorious. You are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved you and gave his life for you. Why? Because of the power of the gospel gave strength to the weak. And lastly, it gives evidence to the skeptics. The family, the friends, your enemies, your adversaries who said, it's not true. This God never existed. He's not real. This Bible is just a book of old fairy tales. And then you got saved. God began to transform your life. Maybe God put your marriage back together. Maybe God put your life back together. Maybe you got beyond some addiction or some problem, and now all of a sudden your family's sitting back, and they're no longer questioning you anymore. They're saying, whoa, there's something, there's something real here. That a, that a notable miracle has been done in our, in our loved ones' lives is, is absolutely true, and we cannot deny it. What is it? It's the power of the gospel. And may God help each and every one of us before we draw our last breath here in this world to experience the life-changing power of the gospel that only the gospel can bring. Amen. If you're here today and you're lost, you need to meet Jesus. You need to experience the power of the gospel.